Well, hello, friends. Salams and peace greetings. Salam, salam. Lovely, lovely to see you all, to see your beautiful faces. Thank you for taking this time and letting us be together again. If you are just getting settled in and you wanted to grab your virtual cup of chai, of drink of choice, uh, feel free to, to do that as we're waiting for our friends to join in. I'm gonna take one quick minute and adore and admire your beautiful faces that I see across my screen. There are some of you who are very well known to me in, in person, and I've had the great joy of um, knowing you with some of you, um, journeying together, traveling together, um, having spent time in person together. And then there's others of you who are known to me mainly um, from the lovely and brilliant uh, questions that you've been asking sometimes on the forum and sometimes sending it to me uh, privately. And then there's a few of you uh, like a deep ocean, silent and serene at the surface, but uh, I can imagine that there is um, with much um, wisdom and excitement uh, underneath. So, This is um, a joy to, to see you. Um, I mentioned that uh, I invited you to grab your drink of choice. And we have met when um, the drink of choice for me has been a warm cup of tea. We have met when it has been um, iced tea. We met during the holy month of Ramadan where the cup of tea was empty. But the container was still there. And we're meeting today where, um, where my feet are located in the state of North Carolina. Uh, it is a warm and humid summery day, um, 86 degrees, but it feels much, much warmer than that. So my cup of tea for today um, is, it's a um, mint effusion uh, filled with a lot of ice water to cool me down just a little bit. So I hope wherever you are, whatever it is that you are drinking, that it brings joy and comfort uh, to you. So I think what I would love to do for today would be um, to get us going a little bit. And um, unlike some of the previous sessions, to be sure to leave quite a lot of time for you to ask some of your questions. So one of the things that I would invite you and us to do um, to make sure that we actually get to some of those questions is uh, don't wait until the last uh, moment. Feel free to go ahead and type in the chat line some of those questions that uh, you would love to see us engage. Um, by the way, it's a, it's a humbling reminder that we've got friends for whom this is four o'clock in the morning. And then we have friends for whom it's now the middle of winter, right? Some of our friends from um, Australia who are joining us um, are mentioning that it is many degrees, seven degrees Celsius, um, which is a chilly sort of a time. So 
um, what, a, what a humbling reminder that even when we think that we have an experience of reality, that it is 2 p.m. where I am and it is a hot and summery day, well, that's true where I am. And there's a vast universe, and this is only in the seen and the tangible realm. There are other places within this very seen uh, and tangible universe where the seasons are complementary and there are untold galaxies. Um, as we are told, there are more galaxies in this world than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the earth. It, it reminds you of how unsatisfactory a um, tribal, national, racial, masculine notion of God can be. If we speak about God as being the um, cherisher, sustainer of all the realms, seen and unseen, and today we hope to speak about um, the sending forth of the divine through the channel of the human being uh, in the guise of the prophets. That if God is Rabbul Alameen, the cherishing, nourishing, sustaining presence of all the universe, then the prophets are also Rahmatan Lil Alameen, um, a mercy sent to all the universes. So anytime that there is the push, there's a move to so localize guidance and inspiration and heaven forbid truth so that we come to think that only this block of humanity, only Muslims, only Jews, only Arab speakers, only men, only white people, only whatever, have a monopoly on truth, then that is settling in for a remarkably little God. And we deserve to have a grander deity. Um, that's the very first step of the prayers, is you begin by raising your hand, Allahu Akbar, God is not only great, God is greater than whatever it is that I have conceived, and indeed God is supreme. So on one hand, yes, we need to have these stories and these allegories, these beautiful teachings, all of these wonderful metaphors to conceive of the divine. And then it's a little bit like your cup. You take it in your hand, you take a sip from that metaphor, and then you put it down. We don't come to confuse that the sum total of all the water in this world is what I have in my cup. Um, so let me invite you, as you're kind of getting settled in, to go ahead and start typing in some of the questions that you would hope for us to um, get to and engage for today. And what I will try to do is to get um, a chance to touch on some of the themes, some of which are talked about in the lesson and some of which may not be. Uh, this is for my benefit and to know how much material to cover. Can I, for those of you who have your videos on, can I see a physical show of hand? for how many of you have, in fact, already watched lessons nine and 10? A physical show of hands. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then for those of you who have your video off, if you have already witnessed those uh, two lessons, feel free to raise your hand online so I can just get a sense of that as well. Like I said, you don't need to have done it to join this conversation, but it's helpful for me to know how much material. All right, that's again, quite helpful. Thank you. You can put your hands down. 
All right. So let's begin by going through some of this um, kind of material. And I'll start with certain themes that um, might have been hinted at in the lessons, but we didn't get to go over them. If you remember when we were starting our conversation, uh, we talked about the fact that Azali identifies certain verses of the Quran as being jewels of the Quran, the gems of the Quran, the pearls of the Quran. And he talks about the Arabic language as being like that outer shell that protects the pearl. So you have to open up that shell to get into the pearl inside. The Quran itself refers to itself as the book that has been revealed in clear Arabic. So at one level, yes, the Quran is an Arabic book written, revealed in Arabic. Uh, it is a particular style of Arabic of seventh century Arabian dialect. The Prophet Muhammad is born and lives out his life and passes away in that context of seventh century Arabia. It helps to know something about that particular society. And then we remember that Rumi, Molana Rumi says very clearly in his fireside chats, do you think that the Quran was always written in Arabic? Uh, he says, there was a time that the Quran was written in the sacred realm, but not in a human language. It was written as it were in a divine language. And likewise, when we come to the being of the prophets, even though these two are somewhat related to one another, it's helpful to make a distinction. And that distinction is between the local, particular human manifestation of the prophet as Muhammad, the Arabian merchant prophet, and something within the prophet that is grander that is like the Allahu Akbar, greater, more supreme, more closely related to that divine source. And in our tradition, that is referred to as the Nur Muhammad, the light of Muhammad, the Muhammadan light. And the usual explanation that we're given is that as there is one God and there is one humanity, there is ultimately also one guidance, one revelation, one light. As the Sufis and Bob Marley would say, one love. And this one guidance is manifested through all the prophets and all the sages. Traditionally, the number that we have been given for it in the Islamic tradition is 124,000, which is a large number that you can more or less translate as gazillion, right? And the Quran quite emphatically says, there's never been a people to whom was not sent a prophet. In other words, any sage, any teacher who brings this kind of divine guidance and gently, lovingly calls people back to the divine, reminds them that if you love God, you got to be accountable for those in your society who are vulnerable, the poor, the orphan, the needy, the widow, the stranger, reminds us that our actions have a cosmic consequence, whether you wanna think of it as karma 
whether you want to think of it as a day of judgment and reckoning, but all of these prophets and all of these sages have come forth from one guidance. So there is a saying of the blessed prophet in which he says, the very first thing that God created was my soul. The very first thing that God created was my soul. And interestingly enough, there are some variations of that saying. Sometimes we're told the very first thing that God created was the spirit. The philosophers like it to be the first thing that God created was the intellect. And Rumi puts it a little differently. He says, Zodiast Maro, Modere Ishk Azaval. So it was mother love. It was the mother of love that gave birth to me. And then he goes on quite specifically to identify love and this maternal experience of love as being none other than the prophet. So I'll read you this line. He says, Ishqast tariqu rahe peygambar ma. Ma zade ishqo ishq shud madar ma. So, love, and the word that he's using is ishq in Persian, um, ashk in Turkish, uh, radical love. This radical love is the tariqa, it is the path, it is the rah, it is the road of our prophet. We have been born from love, and love has become our mother. So, in another poem, he says it um, rather than using the metaphor of um, birth, he actually uses the metaphor of love making. He says, God made love to love, and love became pregnant with God. Like it's, it's a sensual, erotic, suggestive metaphor. And that firstborn of creation, love, the spirit of guidance, the light of Muhammad, is what all the elements are born from. So earth and water and fire and air, that these are all born out of love. They're not a thing. That the earth is not some inanimate object. It's not a thing that you walk on. It's the child of love. If you would, in a poetic context, it's mother is love and it's father is God, or it's father is love and it's mother is God, right? That kind of a suggestive language. And all of these, for Rumi, of course, are associated with the prophet. Ibn Arabi, at one point, um, may God have mercy on all of these sages. He goes on to say that any strength that I have ever experienced in my life, I derived it from the prophet whom he calls the chief of lovers, Rasul Muhibbin. Right? So it's a metaphor of a caravan. There's a caravan of lovers and the camel or the steed in the front that's leading the whole caravan, he says, is, is the prophet. So what I want to do is I would love to show you um, some beautiful images. Those of you who have already seen um, those lessons might have encountered some of these before. And if you have not, hopefully this will be useful. Um, Sure, the sound is on. Yep. Okay.
those of you who have an experience traveling to um, shrines of luminous people, um, of course, shrine pilgrimage, uh, the visitation to the tombs of what for a shorthand we could call saints, uh, is a familiar practice in almost all religious uh, traditions. And, and this is the example that I always love to come back to. It is the tomb of a Moroccan Sufi named Ibn Mashish, Ibn Mashish. And what is distinctive about him, of course, is that you see that there's a magnificent ancient tree that has grown out of the tomb. And that metaphor is, is very powerful for us because within our tradition, there is a notion that spiritual traditions and religious communities are sometimes compared to a tree. We have some friends among us uh, who are huge lovers of these living sages, the trees. The trees are the oldest living sages on earth. Uh, we have trees on earth that were alive when the prophet was alive. We have trees on earth when Christ and maybe the Buddha were alive. They were alive. And Ibn Mashish, this um, semi-literate, simple Moroccan mystic, composes an extraordinary poem not about the earthly quality of the prophet Muhammad, but rather about this Muhammadan light, about this Nur Muhammad. And at that level, his poem sounds very similar. Uh, if you come from a Christian context and you have heard um, Christ referring to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, right? Uh, the first and the last. Well, this will sound very similar to that notion. It's not so much that Jesus is competing with Muhammad and Muhammad is competing with the Buddha. It is that there is one light that shines through all of them. Um, the metaphor that I've heard sometimes use is, sometimes people have said that the 20th century was a century in which we fought over oil. The 21st century might be the century that we fight over water and we fight over um, a body of river that now this nation might imprison behind the dam and keep it somebody else from receiving. What if we actually saw all the waters on earth as being one? But here we give it a name and we call it the Atlantic Ocean. And there we give it a name and we call it the Pacific Ocean. And here the Mediterranean and there the Persian Gulf. Here the river Amazon and there the rain that's falling from heavens, but there's one water. So that's the kind of metaphor of what we are going for. And so this is the a uh, short little prayer that um, I would love to play a minute of, and then I'll read for you a couple of lines. Um, so these lines are beautiful in Arabic. They are ornate and spiritually rich. But what is extraordinary about them is that the people who are reading and reciting these poems you know, these are not some academic PhDs. This is a very humble gathering of lovers of God, and they refer to themselves as uh, the fuqara, which means the poor folk. The fuqara, the poor folk. Um, I was reminded of something recently, which is, um, when we were going through the lessons of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we spend a lot of time talking about the feminine imagery of those verses. Um, that the words Rahman and Rahim come from the words for, for womb, that the prophet himself is called Rahmatun lil alameen, the one whose womb-like 
part uh, reaches out towards all the creation and that even the prophet at some point is called to have maternal qualities and to have been even like a shy bride on one hand and a brave warrior on the other. So those words like an-nabi al-ummi, the maternal prophet, we spend a lot of time talking about its feminine imagery. But there's another meaning that's, I think, important as well. When you read a lot of the commentaries and even some Quran translations, when they get to that phrase, an-nabi al-ummi, and I'll put this in the um, chat line as well, an-nabi al-ummi, rather than translating it as the unlettered prophet or uh, my least favorite translation, the illiterate prophet, the translation that they prefer, and some commentaries agree with this, is the prophet for the everyday people, the common folks prophet, the folksy prophet, the earthy prophet, the humble prophet. Um, in Black American culture, uh, think about someone like Malcolm X and his language, the prophet who makes things plain. He makes it plain to you. And that notion that the prophet represents a reconciliation of two rather different qualities. On one hand, the light of the prophet, the soul of the prophet is the very first thing created by God. That all of the elements are created from this Mohammedan light. But on the other hand, he is an extraordinary, extraordinarily humble being. And the metaphor to go back to Rumi again, the metaphor that Rumi uses for this is if you come across, I think it's a peach tree or an apple tree is the metaphor that he uses. If you come across a fruit tree, the fruit tree that has the ripest, juiciest, most succulent fruit to offer you is the one whose branches are hanging so close to the ground that they're brushing up against the dirt of the soil. It says that's the one who's so pregnant with sweet fruit that it becomes dusty, earthy. And then he very humbly says, um, of all the prophets, and of course he's saying this as a Muslim, uh, of all the prophets, the earthiest prophet was Muhammad. Um, and he's using a clever fruit pun here, uh, fruit ripen the longer you leave them on a tree. And he says, Muhammad lingered on the tree of prophethood the longest because he was the last prophet. That's why he was the juiciest prophet, the most sweet prophet. Um, of course, he's saying this as a Muslim, no doubt a Buddhist and a Jew and a Christian would each have their own interpretations. So let's um, listen for a minute or two of this. <laughs> Oh, 
سابق ولا لاحق فرياض الملكوت بزهر جماله مونقا وحياض الجبروت بفيض أنواره متدفقا ولا شيء Um, so you'll notice that she starts the recitation of Ibn Mashish's prayer on the Prophet with that famous line of the Quran, in the Laha wa Malaikatahu Yusalun al Nabi. Indeed, God and the angels send blessings on the Prophet. So, O oh, you faithful, you also bless him. And the word that is used in uh, the Quran here, yusalluna, um, comes from the same root as salat, as prayers, the five times a day daily prayers. And the mystics have had a lot of fun with that verse of the Quran. What does it mean to speak about God and the angels praying on the prophet? Blessing, adoring the prophet. Um, Ibn Mashish's line starts with Allahumma salli ala ma minhu in shakatil asrar. O God, bless upon the one from whom burst open the secrets of the heart. And that word asrar is both secret and the innermost layer of the heart. From whom burst forth the secrets of the heart. When Falakatil Anwar, and from whom stream forth the lights, and in whom rise up the haqaiq, the realities. If you want to get a sense of the poetic nature of these kinds of adorations, Faryadul Malakut Bizahri Jamalihi Munika, the gardens of the Malakut, the spiritual realm, blossom with the resplendence of his beauty. And the reservoirs of the world of dominion, Jabarut, overflow with the outpouring of his light. And then this notion that the world is created through this Muhammadan reality, and there is nothing except that it is connected to this light. Everything is created out of this light. Um, so, you know, by the time you get into this level of seeing something in the prophet beyond his earthly creature, we are far, far beyond the simple notion that Muhammad is just a man, just a man, just a man who happened to have been blessed with the Quran, right? We're talking about a being of cosmic significance. Um, and to that extent, Muhammad becomes a stand-in for all of the prophets and all of the sages. And I think the last thing that I want to say um, um, before turning to your questions was um, in the second uh, lesson that uh, I had asked you to take a look at for today, it deals with that particular verse of the Quran where um, God is addressing Moses and Moses's mother. Let me change this. There we go. Share screen. Okay. You all can see this verse of the Quran now as well? Good. Um, and in particular, when Moses' um, mother, in this great moment of anxiety, is told to put him in a little chest, in a bassinet, and to trust that chest into the river, and that the river is going to take him to the Pharaoh 
but God is going to watch over, to protect Moses. And there's this particular verse here. وَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي وَلِتُسْنَعْ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِي right? um, Those of you, those of us who um, have found a home in uh, the Chishti order and the legacy of uh, Hazrat Anayat Khan, you know that Hazrat Anayat Khan and Pir Vilayat have been very fond of this verse of the Quran. They come back to it again and again. Um, Right. And so the significance of this verse is this is one of the places in the Quran, though not the only, oh, uh, not the only place where um, we see God talking about casting a glance of love towards someone. But God is going to cast this glance of mahabba, of loving kindness, towards Moses and that he's going to be shaped and fashioned according to that glance. And I want to end um, the portion that I speak about here is about this notion of a glance, of a love glance. Um, I've mentioned this in some of the lessons before. This is unfortunately one of the indications that we have um, of how impoverished so many of these spiritual teachings have come to be in a modern day. Whereas this word nazar, nazar, which is the common word for a glance in Arabic and Persian and Turkish and probably some other Islamic languages, in modern Muslim cultures, it means almost exclusively evil eye. So if you go shopping in the bazaars of Istanbul and you ask for a nazar, what they give you is this. They give you an evil eye amulet to ward off the evil eye. And all around the Mediterranean, um, you will find things like this, the hand of Fatima, the Hamsa, the Hamsa, Muslims, Christians, and Jews all have it. Um, and the common theme is that there's an eye-like creature uh, that is in the middle of this. And the idea is that someone goes to give you the evil eye and this amulet that you're hanging somewhere near you, instead of their negative energy entering your soul through your eyes, the amulet distracts them and they direct their energy towards this. And so therefore they catch the evil eye and you're safe. Uh, and perhaps there is a wisdom to that as well. What I find so interesting is when you read Sufi manuals, the lives of the saints, the lives of the prophets, it has nothing to do with evil eye, with a glance, with negative energy, and it has everything to do with what the Quran talks about, the glance of God. And many Sufi teachers talk about there are times in your life that you experience this loving glance. Um, many of you know that um, my wife Karina and I have been blessed with a beautiful baby. She will soon be four months old. Um, and it's really, you know, whenever you think that you, you're making great progress on the spiritual path, all you have to do is to take a look at this four-month-old baby because literally every single time that she looks at her mom, she smiles. And it's not like one of those fake, polite smiles. It is like joy. It's like, I can't take it. It's like the love just takes over her whole being. And if she's glancing at 
usually it's the mom. Every now and then it's the baba as well. The mama has an advantage that I don't. Two of them, to be precise. She never looks away. She never gets tired of that love glance, right? If, if we were all in the same room and I asked you to turn to the person next to you and love glance them, most people last about five seconds before you start to giggle uncomfortably and turn away. That's the way that the Mi'raj, the heavenly ascension is described in the Quran, that when the prophet reaches the highest realm of paradise and he has his eternal moment with God, his eyes do not turn away. He remains directly fixed upon the divine. And of course, the Quran says it wasn't with the eye of the head that he saw God, but rather with the fuad, with the eye of the heart. So babies have this love glance. Sometimes when love is particularly new, you see lovers and beloveds lost in each other's gaze. You hope and pray for them that it lingers for decades. Um, sometimes certain teachers and people in the spiritual community offer each other that glance. Many people describe the first time that they meet their teacher having that feeling of having come home, having come to a home that maybe they never knew before. Um, and as I've recently learned to expand my understanding of this, nor is the love glance restricted to the human realm. Uh, we have a beautiful puppy, RG, RG boy, as we call him. Um, and RG boy is a good dog. He is a good dog and he knows that he's a good dog. And RG boy gives you not a puppy eye glance, but a love glance. And he will sit with his head buried between his paws and love glance you from across the room. And if you walk across the room, he will follow you with his eyes. And if you walk back, he will watch you walk back and he will not turn away. So babies have a love glance. Lovers and beloveds have a love glance. People in the spiritual community have a love glance. And you can have that same love glance with animals that you love and they love you. Part of this experience of walking in the footsteps of the prophet, it's not about the length of your beard. It's not about what kind of pants that you wear. It has a lot to do with, can you fashion your glance according to the way that the prophets and the sages looked at people? Can you transform your mouth and your tongue to speak to people in the way that would only invite and summon people back to God and not drive people away? Can you listen to people in a prophetic way, to hear what they're saying, to hear what is unsaid, and to hear what might be being said clumsily. Can our touch be a touch that is the touch of the saints? It is only invited when asked for, only to comfort. All of this brings us to this notion, to this reality, that just as the light of Muhammad chose to find in the body of Christ, 
in the body of the Buddha, in the body of Muhammad, an earthly home, that your body is also a necessary part of your spiritual path. The body is not a suitcase. The body is not just something that you discard in order to be spiritually alive and liberated. The body is a training ground and a means of beautification. It's a channel for grace and for beauty, for gentleness into this realm. So to honor your body, to honor your senses, to honor your sight, far before you even think about the impact that it has on somebody else, to be not just mindful, but heartful of what is flowing through you, through us, inshallah. Um, let's pause here. And I keep waiting for you all to type some questions in the chat line. And, um, and so I'll start going through them. Uh, feel free to keep typing um, and we'll try to get to them. I see that there's a wonderful question from Imam Salim. Uh, can I ask you to read your question if you're still, yes, yeah, I, I see you right there. Maybe unmute yourself if you don't mind. Yes, I, I had to find my question. <laughs> Um, so the question uh, has to do with something you said in the very beginning of this uh, sohbet, and it is about the, uh, the pearl in the oyster, really. Um, if we look at the Arabic as being the shell that needs to be opened. So, so having grown up in a coastal town, I know that when you want to open an oyster or open a uh, a shell, you need a sharp knife to do it. So in this case, what would be the knife that we would use to unlock the Arabic language in order to gain access to the pearl within? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Imam Salim, for, for that. Um, you know, this issue of, of language is one that um, people place a uh, a, a great deal of discussion on. And of course, in cultures and civilizations where poetry and song and music, um, aphorisms have had such an important role. Uh, they've played a huge role in Arabic, but not just Arabic, also Persian and Turkish and Urdu and Wolof and Malay and lots of other languages um, as well. Um, and I'm gonna give a two part um, extension of this conversation, which is kind of how I like to look at these, not so much an answer. On one hand, to be mindful of the fact that the ego, the nafs, um, is a very slippery thing. So it's a trickster. Um, and the nafs basically has one motto and its motto is, anything other than Allah. Give me anything other than Allah. What does Ibn Arabi say? Everything that can reveal God to you can also veil you from God, right? So there are many of us for whom the study of Arabic, the study of Persian, perhaps the study of Turkish and Urdu and Wolof and other languages, has been an extraordinary way of experiencing God. Those are precisely those of us for whom there can also be a measure of pride in feeling that, oh, look at us. I have studied Wright's book of Arabic grammar, and therefore I can really get close to God. Well, um, Eben Mashish was probably illiterate and he was much closer to God than probably most of us will ever be. Um, so we, on one hand, language is the raft that carries you across the river, to use a Buddhist metaphor. 
If you get on the raft of Arabic and Persian and Turkish and Hebrew and Sanskrit, and you get to the other side of the river, mazel tov. Alhamdulillah. Tebriklar. Mabruk. Afarin. Then leave the boat. Because God doesn't speak Arabic, nor God speaks Persian or Turkish. So on one hand, to make sure that we don't make an idol of this study of language, um, many Sufis have said, there's only two people in the Quran who are promised hellfire. Abu Lahab, the prophet's uncle, and his wife. And they're both native Arabic speakers. Just because you speak Arabic doesn't mean that the secrets of the Quran will be unveiled upon you, right? That's on one hand. On the other hand, we live in a really weird age. And the weirdness of the age is, I mean, look at us. We are 62 friends right now. We got some of us in North America. We got some friends in the UK. We got some friends in Sweden. We got some friends in Australia. I don't know where else some friends are at right now. We can go on some website and we can find Sufi books and download them, sometimes translated from all these different languages and sources. And we spend a lot of time arguing over the linguistic meanings of certain verses of scripture. Think about all of the time and effort and energy that our Christian sisters and brothers have spent over three verses of the Bible about same-sex relations. And think about all the time that we as Muslims have spent arguing over chapter four, verse 34 of the Quran, right? Um, which some people call the wife beating verse of the Quran. What if, and this is just a suggestion, what if a tenth, a one hundredth of the energy that people spend in linguistic analysis of those verses, we would spend going to the people who have become the walking Quran, the breathing Quran, the living Quran. That's what the prophet himself was called by his wife, the walking Quran. If you have a question about what a verse means, go to the people who don't speak about the teaching, their very breath has become the teaching. Their glance, their love glance has become that teaching and observe them and ask yourself, is this a person who would exclude someone or was the first thing that Jesus do was to go to the prostitutes and the lepers and the poor and the discarded of each community. When you see the way that the prophet treated his daughter and the women in his community, ask yourself, is the one who was sent as a mercy to all the worlds, someone who would ever inflict violence on someone? And God hasn't shut down the bazaar the marketplace of mercy has not run out of goods. The emanation of light continues until our own age. So I think to um, keep going and um, visiting them. So thank you so much for um, that wonderful question. And this is just an extension of it. Um, there's a question from um, a friend, and I'm gonna guess that because they sent it um, to me directly, that maybe they would not mind if I just shared the question. Um, and they're talking about how to exercise greater uh, humility 
uh, in their salat, in their prayers. Uh, and that there's a lot of feelings of perhaps shame and guilt and um, anger that tend to come up. Um, again, this is not an answer. Uh, it's just a, let's walk together. Let's journey together. Um, and a couple of observations. Sometimes when people begin um, progressing deeper on any kind of a spiritual practice, there is a level of softening of the heart, of unearthing what has been buried below. And that burial itself is sometimes a survival mechanism. And you might discover a lot of these kinds of um, pain and, and resentment. And there, I think, what I always encourage us to do is to take that pain and, and sit with it rather than looking to banish it or to deny it or least helpful of all, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Um, almost have a level of curiosity about it. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Where, where have you come from? Where have you been? What have you experienced? And the hope that I would love to share with you is that underneath that anger, there is a still serene ocean. That behind any cloud in the firmament of your soul, there's a luminous moon. Because your innermost nature, your deepest heart, what in Muslim language we would call your fitra, your jeweled nature, is divine, is beautiful, is luminous. You've been created in that form. And sometimes when there is that anger or envy or trouble with a religious practice, ask yourself, is it about the practice itself? Or is it about an occasion in life where a person or a community or a teacher, especially someone in the position of authority, behaved in a way that was less than loving, less than kind, less than affirming. In my own exploration, you cannot just banish something from the heart without offering it something lovelier, right? There's a, that beautiful verse in the Quran, repel evil with something that's more beautiful, something that's more filled with ihsan, lovelier. So just as hopefully you wouldn't eat cardboard and material that is not filled with sustenance and, and nutrition, don't spiritually eat cardboard. Don't listen to the people whose views on religion are um, dry and judgmental. Go to the sages. Go to the ones for whom the prayers are an occasion to come face to face um, with the beloved. Um, I think Gary Jan is, is adding a very lovely reminder that underneath that anger, there's also pain to also be curious about the pain. And where there is pain, all the layers that are above it are sometimes the scab, the protective layers that we've had to develop. And sometimes that very protection has been what's kept you from getting more hurt. But you're not doomed to always have pain, to always be wounded. Genuine healing is possible. 
but we have to go and work through that pain and that difficulty. Um, so to come back to that question of, uh, of prayers, it's very helpful, I find, just as with the prophet, there's the notion of he is on one hand, the firstborn of creation, the, the Nur Muhammad that shines through all the prophets and all the sages. And on the other hand, he is the humblest of people, right? Remember, he's the person who used to sleep on a bed of straws. And so his family talks about when he would wake up in the morning, there would be straw signs on his side. A very humble um, person as well. And likewise in prayer, that on one hand, when you're standing up straight, right, the aleph of your being, the one of your being, uh, is the axis that connects heaven and earth, that you never pray solo, that you're always praying with every bird, every tree, every river, every mountain, every breeze. And on the other hand, when you bow down and prostrate yourself, you're taking the part of you that we usually hold up high, the forehead, and you lower it to that mother, the earth mother, as Rumi calls it. You come from the soil and there's a part of you that will return to the soil. And so prayer is both. It is standing in majesty, representing God for all creation and returning in humility to the soil. And we've got to learn to balance these two, to soar on the wings of both of these qualities. Um, I'm mindful of the time. I'm mindful of having us been together for an hour. So let me leave us with one more um, Rumi anecdote. Um, no doubt many of you have heard this, but it, um, it connects to what we were just talking about. Um, in in uh, Molana's own lifetime, his reputation had spread far and wide, uh, not only as a poet and as a teacher and as a scholar, but, um, but as a great sage, as a lover of God. So we're told that there was a monk, a Christian monk, Greek Orthodox monk, who lived in what was at that time Constantinople. Constantinople had not yet become Istanbul who hears about this great lover of God in Konya. And even though they were from different religious traditions, he journeys from Constantinople all the way to Konya. Um, if you go by bus today, it's about a 10 hour bus ride. So imagine in the 13th century on a caravan, how long that journey was. And um, so the monk travels and, and um, he comes all the way to Konya, might have taken him a few weeks. And um, he asks for Molana Rumi and he goes in and, and he sees one upon whose countenance there is a light. Um, and so he goes up to him and says, are you Molana? He's like, yes. Um, and the monk out of love and respect and adoration bows down to Rumi. And he says, I stayed bowing down to him for 10, 15 seconds to show my respect for him. And then I got up to start talking to him and I saw that he was still bowing down to me. So he goes back down. He says, I stayed down for 10 more seconds. And then I got up to start asking my questions and I saw that he was still bowing down to me. So I went back down. The monk says, 33 times I lifted up my head and 33 times I saw that he was still bowing down to me. And then the monk does this thing that in the medieval tradition is the equivalent of, I can't take it anymore, which is like 
he takes his shirt and he like rips it, right? He rips this front part of his chest is like, ah, and he goes, where do you get this humility from? After all, and this is the monk's own language, not what Rumi is using, says, I'm just an infidel. Right? I'm not even one of your religious community. Where do you get this humility from? And the only thing that Molana Rumi says is, this is the way of our sultan, by which he means the prophet Muhammad. Um, if God saw you as being worthy of a soul, who am I to treat you with any less respect than that? And because this is a Rumi story and a Muslim story, the monk is like, I want to be a Muslim Sufi too, you know? So um, all the stories kind of end that way. But there's that example of the prophetic path is the way of humility. It's the way of seeing the honor and the dignity, the nobility of everyone. And it's the way of sweetness. It is the tree that has a lot of sweet and succulent fruit to offer, not the tree that hangs its head up high out of some fake nobility. So may it be that, uh, inshallah, some of these teachings and some of these stories uh, offer us a chance to not only ascend to the presence of God, as in a miraj, but to return, but to return to humanity and to summon that sacred and divine realm down here. Uh, all right, friends, uh, we have in very proper brown people style gone overboard. Um, so I send you all the love that is already with you. Um, we will have, inshallah, another session coming up in July. And then another one, inshallah, in August. And um, um, after that, we shall see what comes next. Um, I've been tempted to um, do another follow-up course on um, radical love, uh, maybe building on offering some commentary on the teachings that are in the radical love book, um, maybe mentioning some of the original phrases and terminology. Um, there's a few of you who have been writing me and asking about um, the opportunities to extend uh, the access to the Quran course. Um, and so if, um, I think I have sent that um, via an email, but um, if you have not yet had a chance to extend your access, um, you can do so, and I'll put this in the chat line. Yeah, um, and the platform um, provider, we reached an arrangement with them. So I think they charge $50 to have permanent ongoing access um, for, for that, um, for that service. And um, sometime in the future, um, there's a couple of other courses that I've been uh, hoping and dreaming about, but um, as, as uh, all of us who love to cook know, the best tasting foods are the ones that are slow cooked. Um, and uh, so they, it, they, takes, they take a good while. There, is, um, uh, there, there may someday, inshallah, be one on the mystical statements of the prophet uh, so that you can really come to, inshallah, have a greater intimacy with uh, that aspect of the prophet beyond 
the sort of usual kind of hadith books. Um, and uh, so the kind of hadith statements that Rumi and Ibn Arabi and others would cite from, um, from the Prophet. Um, I have to tell you a joke. I know we're over time, but I have to tell you a joke. Um, there's this wonderful Persian saint um, named Kharaqani that I'm so fond of. And some of you have heard me talk about from time to time. He has one book and it's a short little book. Um, and the book has 10 chapters. And chapter three is mystical sayings of the prophet. There's one copy of this manuscript in the whole world. Of course, it's in the British Library in London, of course, where else would it be? Kharapani must have a wicked sense of humor. The book is a few hundred pages long. Chapter three is blank. Because the mystical teachings of the prophet cannot be made to fit on a white page with blank ink. You can only realize them in the heart. I was like, you're killing me, bro. You're just killing me. Um, that's a true story. Um, so anyway, at some point we may inshallah have, have, have that um, and um, as well, but um, yes, yes. Uh, and those, are, since this has been a common question from quite a few of you, um, there is no, um, there is no um, immediate, totally um, clear green light for us resuming our, our journeys and travels together, but some signs are moving in that direction. Um, certainly there's more and more of us who have been able to get vaccinated. Um, and uh, I feel uh, hopeful, hopeful, that inshallah, with the grace of God and the hard work of all the people on the ground, that we might be able to resume our in-person journeys uh, to Turkey and Morocco in 2022. Um, and of course, I will continue to keep you all uh, posted about that. So um, let me linger no more. Um, sending you all love and gratitude for your time. Uh, if you end up having other suggestions, other questions, please go ahead and drop me a note. And just know that um, truly, truly, I cherish you. I cherish this time together um, and look forward to seeing you again, inshallah. So much love, my friends. خیلی متشکرم. خواهش میکنم. خواهش میکنم. لطف شما هم میرسینه. اوی جان. تینکیو سو باش عزیزم. خواهش میکنم. لطف داریم. واقعا. خدا نگهداری عزیزم. به سلامت. <تصفيق>